Agencies such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the World Health Organization, which the Bureau of Meteorology rely upon for data, are telling us that only 5% of the total UV index reaching the ground is UVB. This bogus UV chart is based on the flawed data. How did we come to this conclusion? Apart from the inconsistency of what these agencies are telling us as opposed to what is happening in the real world, we have UV measurements that tell us otherwise. What I want to demonstrate today is the UVB content of the total UV index. I have two instruments. The first one, the general, will measure the UVA and B combined, and the second one, the omega, will measure UVA singularly. We'll subtract the UVA from the total UV index and see what the UVB content is. So I'll face the probe towards the sun and see what results we get. So we're averaging around high 15 milliwatts per centimetre square, low 16s milliwatts per centimetre square. As you can see, the max. And with the UVA, we are averaging high fives, about 5.8 milliwatts per centimetre square. If we subtract the UVA from the total UV index, we're left with about 60 plus percent of UVB. And that's definitely not what the official agencies are telling us. What awaits us in the next few years is unforeseen by the majority. Granted, these basic UV meters may not be comparable to the sophisticated equipment used by official agencies, thus the accuracy of the UV meters can be argued, but the state of the flora is inarguable. In fact, the state of the flora give more credence to the results of the UV measurements than the calibration certificate itself. Furthermore, we have so many incidents of sunscreen that is manufactured based on the official data failing to provide adequate protection. Optical harm from the excessive UVB on the other hand is a whole subject on its own. So how is it that the ozone layer continues to deplete despite the Montreal Protocol that phased out so many substances which contributed to the ozone depletion such as chlorofluorocarbons, better known as CFCs, where chlorine radicals are released and catalytically react with ozone. Unbeknown to the vast population of the world, the primary cause of ozone depletion is seven decades of climate engineering. Tens of millions of tons of nano-sized material are dispersed directly into the upper troposphere by jet aircraft. Mainly consistent of metal oxides, these particulates are desiccants in nature and absorb moisture and oxygen. Another mechanism that is well overlooked is how the ozone layer is replenished. In the first step, Solar ultraviolet radiation breaks apart two oxygen molecules to produce an oxygen atom. In the second step, each of these highly reactive atoms combine with the oxygen molecules to produce an ozone molecule. Wind and evaporation supply oxygen from the oceans to the upper atmosphere. Both these processes are inhibited by climate engineering. The light wave length is altered by the light scattering reflective particles dispersed in the atmosphere, thus affecting the process of evaporation and wind is diminished by the same particles interfering and reducing the atmospheric pressure difference that creates wind. Furthermore, phytoplankton including algae and trees produce oxygen by photosynthesizing the sunlight. Once again, this process is hindered thanks to a shredded ozone layer that is allowing the penetration of lethal levels of radiation, harming and reducing the population of such species that produce oxygen. And if we add the fact that these particulates absorb the oxygen required to produce ozone, it is no wonder why we have such a rapid rate of depletion. In essence, this is a feedback mechanism, primarily facilitated by climate engineering. Back to Australia. Melanoma incidence, also known as skin cancer, is epidemic beyond any other populated region in the world, especially in Melbourne. The city averages around four months of full sunshine annually. If we had the sunshine equivalent to, say, the Mediterranean, life would most likely cease to exist here. 
Melbourne man Greg Farrington bears the scars of countless Queensland summers spent in the sun during the 1970s and 80s. Last year I had eight cancers cut off my head and then late last year again one cut off my nose. His father died of skin cancer and now the 54 year old keeps well away from deadly rays. It's a silent killer. New Victorian medical statistics reveal in 2018 almost 300 people were burned so badly following sun exposure they needed to visit an emergency department. These are shocking findings. It's a worry. It shows that we've got more work to do. According to SunSmart, 50% of presentations to emergency were patients under 19. Of these, 48 were children, including toddlers. Melanoma doctors say the symptoms of sun poisoning are more than skin deep. So a severe sunburn requiring emergency department treatment uh, might include blistering, symptoms of feeling unwell, headache, nausea. Cancer Council experts believe many of the acute burns are occurring because of reliance on sun cream alone. And while this 50 plus lotion is very effective, more protection is needed. Let's look at Queensland, where the iconic Great Barrier Reef is. It isn't just iron because of the acidification and warming of the oceans. Harmful UV levels are also damaging the DNA of the coral. Climate engineering is harming life from every angle. The order followers that involve themselves in these programs undermine the complexity of life, if they actually care about it at all. Dismantling the cultural subservience immediately is absolutely critical. As we all stand in the crossroads of this dark hour, all those blindly following orders should consider that the collapse of all life on earth will be the final testament that authority was a misapprehension.